Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 23rd of June, 2024. Uh, I had a very late last night, all self-inflicted, friends and games and drink and good times, very late night. I, by rights, should be proper struggling today. I'm all right at the moment, but I can tell you my words might not flow as freely as they normally would. Uh, my neuronal pathways have been intercepted by uh, an, a wine assault on them. So I do apologise if I make very little sense in this video. Right. Okay. We'll start where we normally start. Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply, of course, and you can find them in the description to the video below. 1,270 personnel lost is an uptick from where we have seen it for the last week or so. It's been around the 1,100 mark. It's only a relatively small uptick, but I think this probably indicates that yesterday was a fairly hot day along the front lines and there are quite a few um, pieces of combat uh, equipment lost as well. 10 tanks is a snip above average, not the highest, but it is going to hurt. I keep talking about unsustainable losses. I think the Russians are going to be, or indeed are running out of some of this combat, uh, at some of these combat assets, such as tanks and armored personnel vehicle. We'll have a look at tracked garden shed in a, in a wee while to get a sense of where the Russians are at. Anyway, 15 armored personnel vehicles is average. Uh, 61 artillery systems is a huge loss in that category. Uh, two MLRS and two anti-aircraft warfare systems. Again, uh, these are around about sort of average or so. I mean, much smaller numbers in these categories. But two anti-aircraft warfare systems could be, if they are high value assets, could be um, serious for the Russians there. Or they could just be auto cannons on the back of a... Uh, Camas or something, right? We have a uh, we have forty four vehicles and fuel tanks taken out yesterday, and eight pieces of special equipment. Uh, but yeah, going back to that, sixty one artillery systems is huge. I was watching Anders Puck Nielsen's video this morning talking about drone on drone uh, warfare, if you like. But he was talking a lot about how the defenders have the advantage, and it certainly is true. I've talked about this previously, but. With regard to who's going to take higher losses, you are going to see the Russians in these offensive periods take higher losses than the Ukrainians. Because the question is always, well, what are the Ukrainians lost? And we'll look at Andrew Perpetua's stats. And actually, they've, they've been approaching nearer parity for the last three or four days. But in general, the Russians have, have lost huge amounts of equipment because if you are attacking um, established dug-in positions... The defenders don't really need to commit all a lot of mechanized equipment there, particularly if you're talking about um, trenches and these dugouts. So the Russians might well be attacking with, you know, the received wisdom is you've got to have three to one uh, advantage over overpowering, over outnumbering the defenders by three to one if you're going to think about taking those positions and it goes up if you're in urban environments. Um, but the, the defenders are going to be dug in. They are going to be um, probably using their artillery, a lot of drones, and you are just having to cross minefields. The attrition that you will experience attacking those fortified positions will be significant. So the Russians having this extended uh, offensive period that's lasted from really October last year to now, kind of a year of Russian offensive it might well be, is going to be an incredibly costly time for the Russians where, yep, okay, yeah, they are taking positions, they are taking villages, they are taking the old town here and there, but at a tremendous cost. And that cost we see on a daily basis, but it's to be expected given the advantage that defenders have, especially when, and this is a key point that he made that I've made many times before, especially when no side ha can get the advantage, sorry, can, it can get the advantage by surprise anymore. When you have that many drones in the air, there is no element of surprise. You can't attack a position unknown and take that position by surprising the enemy uh, because of all those drones in the air are giving 24-7 reconnaissance for both sides of what the other side is doing the whole time. And so that then means it's even harder to 
uh, gain an advantage when attacking. Um, and that means attackers are going to, you know, when, when they are attacking with a, a column of five vehicles, Ukrainians are going to know that Russians are coming. They've seen it from the from the get go, and it's just right. Let's get up as many drones as we can. Hammer, 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 and then if we've got artillery and mortars as well, get them involved. It's just really difficult, and, and the Russians will lose a lot of equipment in so doing. And yeah, so would the Ukrainians as well. So what the Ukrainians are trying to do at the moment is degrade the Russian artillery as much as possible, so that if the Ukrainians do uh, mount an offensive at some point in the future, though those uh, defensive um, capabilities are degraded to the point where actually the Ukrainians won't be losing the the amount of kit and personnel in attacking that the Russians have been losing. Okay, uh, Andrew Perpetua's lost list here, and it, and again he very usefully gives us the combat asset uh, numbers as well. So forty one Russian losses, twenty seven Ukrainian losses. That is. Obviously not as good as we have seen and not what the Ukrainians need. The Ukrainians need a 3-1 to one advantage plus. Now let's look at the combat losses. We've got 19 combat assets, uh, 10 uh, for the Russians and 10 for the Ukrainians. That's so slightly better. And we've seen that last few days where, uh, okay, there's been parity, well, not parity, but approaching parity more. The ratio hasn't been quite so positive. But actually, when you're talking about artillery, uh, tanks, IFVs, MRAPs, APCs, actually the ratio has been slightly better. It's just there's been a lot of surveillance and comms equipment for the for the Ukrainians and maybe a lot of civilian vehicles that, that closes that ratio gap. But um, here we have 19 to 10, so that's a 2 to 1, uh, broadly speaking, combat asset ratio, uh, loss ratio. And then it's also been interesting to look at the destroyed against damage ratio as well because the Russians have been suffering more there than the Ukrainians and yet again we see that here so the brown and black abandoned destroyed that's your worst case scenario uh, and the Russian numbers have a, a much greater proportion of destroyed uh, and abandoned compared to the Ukrainians that ha have here you can see there's more grey there which is good news um, so if we look at that, that ratio, we've got 14 destroyed against 5 damage. So that's kind of like a, a 3 to 1 ratio of destroyed uh, against damage. The Ukrainians have 2 destroyed, 8 damage. So where it's 3 to 1 for the Russians, we have 1 to 4. 3 to 1, 1 to 4. So that ratio is much better for the Ukrainians. And I think that's worth taking into account it's really useful that Andrew now does that at the side I hope he, he continues to do that I don't want him to take up more time than obviously he he already does but that is super useful right now the problem for the Ukrainians here is when you do look at the non-combat assets that have been lost we have two P-18 radars taken out by an X-35 missile KH-35 uh, missile strike uh, that is a, a bit of a problem there because those radars are uh, super useful so that's going to be high value loss then we go down the list and we've got some boats for the ukrainians added in there we've seen a lot of boats for the russians recently not so many for the ukrainians but three added in there uh one sunk one destroyed one damaged so that's going to hurt an excavator vehicle um surveillance of comms as well we've got a bm21 multiple grad multiple launch rocket system that's been damaged um and we have a striker so that's american provided apc damage there humvee um but the usual kind of equipment in the combat asset losses it's just those radars are really going to hurt okay when we come to the Russian equipment losses, we have that Pantsir S1 air defense system uh, that I think I mentioned yesterday. Do I have that here today? Um, yes, is that that? Yeah, over two days, the air few destroyed two Russian Pantsir missile systems together with their crews, uh, although the Russians initially denied that the crews were hit. But you're thinking this has been hit by a, probably the Gimlers. And I doubt the crews are getting away from that. Anyway, one was on the Bel Belgorod District Road. The other was covering a group that was trying to advance on the city of Lipsy. So these are both in that northern area. The Russians are losing quite a bit of kit now um, in the Belgorod 
uh, and into Kharkiv direction. Um, each pantsir costs about fourteen million dollars, right? So when you when you're looking at the value here of some of this kit, so like for example, if Starlink's on there, uh, there isn't, but Starlink's about I said about thousand dollars. Actually, you can get them for about five hundred dollars. So there there are huge differences in the value of this the these bits of kit. Like boats, depends what the boat is, but if it's just something they had nicked off local civilians, a little fishing boat, it's not going to be a huge amount of money. Um, a D20 howitzer, uh, and then you compare it, compare those sort of things to a pants here of $14 million. You've got a huge difference there. Um, uh, okay, so we've got some artillery pieces there, uh, some tanks, BMPs, not huge uh, list. <laughs> APC bathtub one with shed. Uh, so that's obviously some kind of... Um, I, I don't know, but some old school uh, APC that's been turned into a uh, a, a garden shed, uh, m mobile garden shed. Anyway, that that's you can see these are, a lot of these have been destroyed, very few damaged compared to destroyed, uh, and then we're on to a lot of Bukanka loafs, these uh, Scooby Doo vans and quads and whatnot. So Russians have lost quite a lot of kit there. The pants is going to hurt big time. Uh, but but the Ukrainians have lost a couple of bits or a couple of pieces of radar as well, which are um, going to be fairly expensive. So uh, moving on, Tendar here talks about the tract garden shed scenario for the Russians. Uh, we've got another one that's come into the hands of the Ukrainians here. Uh, the Ukrainian army released an extensive video of the infamous Russian turtle tanks. They are far worse than expected. Underneath that garbage is an old T-62M. The gun is not operational, there's no ammunition, and the turret is locked in place. The panels are sheet metal, removed from all kinds of scrap metal. Visibility is expectedly atrocious. The engine burns like it's running on coal, and you can hear them miles away. Worst of all, the pile of Russian scrap metal was taken out by drones, so by something they supposedly should be uh, protected against. So even the electronic warfare component is absolutely rubbish. Um, I've covered several wars where rebels or weaker factions were forced to improvise with what they got, but I've rarely seen something so utterly terrible than this Russian thing. Remember, when it comes to logistics, then there is no difference in transporting a T-90M or this. Both eat up space, time and manpower. In many cases, you have to make them even barely work before sending them to the front. It is relatively wasteful. You would never do anything like this unless you are absolutely desperate. This is a point I've been making all along is that, yeah, these things can do a job, right? This this is a vehicle moving from A to B. If your objective is, right, we need to get from A to B and we need to protect people. This is essentially a vehicle that's being used to drop off people and we need to protect them against drones that, that are flying in then okay as you as you can see in some of these videos then then okay that's fine it, it, it's done its job great it, it's fairly successful at getting from a to b and keeping those people alive but the question is well is this what you would expect if you had like a perfectly functioning army like if, if the u.s were going to go into a war now a ground war now you know would they be using that kind of thing or a striker, right? And the, the, the answer is surely that they wouldn't be using this. This is suboptimal. You've got a, a, a tank that can't move its turret and doesn't have any ammunition, so it can't be used as a tank. Well, like, would you prefer to have that tank as an operational tank or being used as a people carrier? This is effectively an APC. Well, surely, like, even if an APC isn't good enough at protecting against uh, drones, and so you want to build up coat cage and stuff and all sorts around it to attract garden shed or wheeled garden shed, surely it would be better to do that to an APC and keep the tank as a tank and repair the tank. So what, what, what's the issue here? Are they unable to, to repair the tank? Um, or are there needs such that they need APCs more than tanks? And so if you've got a an APC and a tank that need, I don't know, both need repairing, uh, you, you would just turn them both into these kind of garden shed things. 
I, I, the situ I'm just trying to work out the, the rationale that's going on here. And it, like, whichever way you slice and dice this data, it speaks of some kind of desperation for the, for the Russians. So when I talk about unsustainable losses, I think this goes into that idea that, the, you know, they, they don't have the optimal equipment anymore to use on the front lines that they are they are being forced to go to these suboptimal solutions yes it can still work in getting troops from a to b but it bespeaks a a certain desperation now the fact that russia has to resort to haul literal garbage is so telling says tender and reveals once more in what condition the russian army and logistics behind it is it also proves that the longer the war goes on the weaker the quality of the russian army becomes which by the way was never really good in the first place they have to dig deeper in their rotting storage facilities and deploy literal garbage yeah i i'm not sure i disagree at all with that analysis it it's yeah, it's not. I don't think it's the Russian army is in a great place at the moment. Right, Andrew Popech is just going to make some statement on uh, drone footage, and I've kind of made comments concerning the num number of uh, pieces of drone video that have uh, that that are, that are published by the Russians, and how many unsuccessful. Um, pieces of drone footage there are or unsuccessful drone attempts to uh, each successful one what's the ratio uh, what's the proportion of drone activity that is successful and he said there's a misconception that only successful drone attacks are published this might be true for stuff put on twitter but trust me when you dig past the surface level this just isn't true at all when people say this, it pretty much immediately tells me they don't actually watch much drone footage. Of course, Andrew and his team watch a phenomenal amount of footage. Also, it's just really hard to even judge what a success is. Is dropping a grenade into an empty trench a success? Or is hitting something inside the trench a success? I've watched a video where they drop like 50 grenades on top of a bunker to dig a little hole into the roof. Is that a success? Or is a grenade that goes into the hole a success what about when there is a hole but like five grenades in a row miss the hole but they kind of make the hole larger what about the grenade that lands next to the hole and pushes dirt back into the hole i don't even know how to judge success and failure for a lot of stuff and i think when you're talking about hits on fortified positions and bunkers and dugouts and trenches i like i likewise i wouldn't have a clue how to judge success there i think it's easier when you're talking about taking out or attempting to take out an infantry fighting vehicle like if that grenade bounces off the side and and does no damage to the vehicle i think you can count that as a not successful uh, but then you'll get ieds that hit an infantry fighting vehicle that you're unsure whether it's damaged or maybe it's damaged some element of its comms equipment that you can't tell you, you you're not in the vehicle you can't see it communicating or it not communicating so there are still elements of uh, well, it's just a huge spectrum um of damage that that can be done to vehicles and trying to work out what is damaged and what is destroyed can be difficult uh, just to let you know on andrew perpetua's list here he has the ultimate responsibility for determining damage against destroyed so whether he gets it right or wrong it is okay you can argue that but it's going to be consistent so his criteria is very consistent and also very much his own right moving on from drones uh there from andrew perpetual we've talked about the pants here here two pants is being taken out in in a couple of days that's important we're going to go on to uh, guided glide bombs here and their widespread use actually by both sides and of course the russians are using far more than the ukrainians the ukrainians have things like the hammer aasm 50 the uh the french provided guided glide bomb that they're using really effectively that they are apparently going to be um functional with the f-16s that are coming online anyway more precision strikes against russian targets this time in russia itself this russian post which is part of a border station was wiped out by two glide bombs what's interesting here is you have it here and then you have another bomb uh, come down uh, straight away 
and yeah you've got two bombs hitting that that place at, uh, pretty much at the same time and takes it out why i'm including this is because this is the use of guided glide bombs inside russia these are ukrainian aviation you know these are ukrainian aircraft releasing these bombs inside ukraine but they are hitting inside russia so we've talked previously about the use of Gimlers guided multiple launch rocket systems artillery and whatnot uh, here is evidence that this also includes uh, so, um, guided glide bombs so where they can't use ATACMs they are using a range of uh, of ordnance the question is how far into Russia are they allowed to go by the western um, western forces that that are putting these constraints on the Ukrainians here we have another one uh, something that we are increasingly seeing says tender again tender uh, precision strikes by the Ukrainian JDAM and hammer bombs so sometimes hammer sometimes JDAM's not often not entirely sure this time against a Russian base in Nipurudne a coordinates of that strike there so yeah the Ukrainians are definitely using more and more of these guided glide bombs and they have significant destructive capability uh, but whether they are able to compete uh, with the russians using s apparently 3000 kilogram munitions um, i don't know it, the russians so here's the russian using a um a guided guide bomb in the kherson region um, and just shows that that the sheer destructive uh, capability of these bombs when you see mushroom clouds like that uh, and yeah the the russians are definitely using these to devastating effect we're going to go on and see how they've used one in kharkiv or possibly more yesterday uh kharkiv as a city was the site of some pretty devastating russian strikes we are we haven't seen russians use s300s and those surface to air missile systems using ground attack mode on kharkiv ever since the ukrainians took out those air defense systems in belgorod and that was uh, that's made a massive difference to life in kharkiv but yeah still suffering now atesh here partisans carrying out sabotage on a rostov and don uh in Rostov on Don on the on a railway relay cabinet on that new railway from uh, Rostov to Mariupol uh, that one they're making along the south of Donetsk there this railway line plays a key role in transfer of military forces and equipment between various parts of the southern military district so that's a really useful p piece of sabotage one would think right moving on to distant strikes and uh, standoff munitions and whatnot the russians only attacked with three caliber cruise missiles last night uh, they were fired at kiev two were shot down so one did uh, in kiev region one did get through um, so th there is that don't know what damage that might have done on the other hand a major explosion and fire uh, yesterday evening in Rostov, again Rostov, um, in Russia, local sources report that a transformer exploded at the Atlant Market area. You can see very bright uh, explosion there, which could denote that it was indeed electrical. Um, but yeah, significant explosion there, uh, and uh, yeah, lots of people talking about that. Something something burned very strong overnight in Rostov. And actually, I think other explosions being heard as well. So I think Rostov might have been uh, targeted a few times. Now, right now, uh, explosions are being heard across Crimea. Sevastopol has been the scene of some explosions. You have Pretoria as well. Balaclava, air defense active. It's interesting because at, at one time I've seen another post using this picture. So the Russians post pictures like this and say, air defense is active. In other words, we're shooting all the missiles down. You're like, if that's a cluster munition, an ATACM's cluster munition, and that's your evidence that you shot it down a, a small p white puff in the sky i don't i don't think uh, i don't think you're convincing anyone so there there is some scorn uh poured poured on the russians when they do claim that uh that they are sh shooting down these russian these ukrainian ordnance especially when um that ordnance is supposed to be uh, an atacms cluster munition right uh, an explosion also heard in cossack bay where the 810th uh, russian black sea marine brigade is based so lots of talk about crimea at the moment as in right now the bridge i think has been closed as well that's not uncommon explosion here mentioned cossack bay again 810th 
Black Sea Marine Brigade. The enemy attacks with eight Tacken's ballistic missiles. More launches are possible. Crimea and Sevastopol immediately. Uh, all safety measures. Uh, so those are Russian sources talking about the activity there. And next, they're also reporting explosions are shaking Sevastopol, Yepatora and other occupied cities in Crimea. Smoke can be seen rising in the Bay of Sevastopol. So it appears that um, some damage has been done there. Donetsk is also fairly active at the moment. As is often the case, you don't see... It's not, it's not always the case, but some people record um, the outcome of strikes but only record the sky and smoke rising because it's legal to show the scene of strikes um, here obviously you're looking in the direction and then it cuts to uh, above there so you can I, I guess you can know where this is supposed to have taken place but you can get in trouble on both sides so the uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians can prosecute you for showing video footage of, of where strikes take place which is often why you see the bottom part the so here it's cut so you're only seeing the smoke in the in the air the other way they do it is blur out everything at the bottom and then don't blur out smoke um, and that's one way of getting around it but that's always because when you see that and when you see footage like this it's because they're worried about getting prosecuted now uh, as i said harkiv was hit this is just a horrible um uh, uh, bit of footage of someone just walking back from the the market and a massive explosion she's okay or at least you know she's not killed she walks she runs away this way but this is just the middle of Kharkiv just getting ham hammered um so Russia launched a glide bomb directly in the center of Kharkiv yesterday killing at least three Ukrainian civilians and injuring over 50 more another Russian terrorist attack targeting civilians says Ukraine battle map there is no accountability or punishment for Russia Russia must be stopped uh now there was i don't know if this is the same one so i i don't know whether harkiv was um targeted a number of times it was interesting you've got you know because this the city harkiv is it still has civilians in it's summertime people are still trying to lead as relatively normal lives as they can whilst there is a war going on close by and indeed harkiv itself is consistently hit but it's had a couple of weeks now well, what is it since it's probably a month now of not having, as I mentioned, any of the surface-to-air missiles slamming into it. And it's it's really appreciated. I was sp speaking to uh, Pierre, who has contacts in um, Kharkiv, just saying it, it's been absolutely, well, I wouldn't say it's been brilliant for them, but it's been a, a real game-changer for people living in Kharkiv to have the Ukrainians allowed to strike into Belgorod and take out those um, surface-to-air missile systems because it's given them a breather so people trying to relax by the pool uh, while explosions are heard on the horizon you can see just a huge smoke plume a residential apartment building was damaged as a result of the attack um, differing numbers uh, of people dead and, and injured today russia struck harkiv again with guided aerial bombs as of now we know three dead and 19 more injured rescue works continue now i don't know if this is the only uh, place that, that we see this I, as in, I don't know if there were, was more than one uh, guided glide bomb used. But yeah, the number of victims has risen to 42. Um, there you, you can see just a normal street. Res this is definitely not a military target. Uh, this is a guided glide bomb. A guided guide bomb. No, guided glide bomb. Goodness me. Words, eh? Uh, so we don't know whether that was the intended target, whether this was inaccurate, or whether some kind of electronic warfare messed around with its guidance. It is generally understood that the Russians, uh, the Russian bombs are not very easy to uh, to mess with. So I don't, I don't know that this would have been as a result of Ukrainian electronic warfare defense. Is obviously with these bombs, you're not going to take them out with air defense systems um so the there is just a huge challenge for the ukrainians in terms of these guided glide bombs because they they use them so often there there's a really good shot they use them so often um and there's not a lot they can do about them and that's why they need to be able and we're going to come on to talk about this in a second but they need to be able to take out the air bases from uh from where these planes that drop these bombs take off from it's just uh, anyway, um, fighters and rescue workers have completed their work in Kharkiv after Russia's terrorist attack yesterday. 
56 injured, 41 remain in hospital with four of those seriously wounded. Three of the hospitalized are children. And of course, you know, they're, they're dead as well. I think three or four maybe died in that attack. Um, okay, uh, Russia continues to destroy Ukrainian energy infrastructure. Today's combined attack comprised, so this is going back to yesterday and talking about overnight, 16 missiles and 13 Shahid, so not last night, the night before. They targeted energy infrastructure in um, in all those different places, Lviv, Ivano-Frankivsk, Volyn and Zaporizhia regions. It is consistently degrading. The, these sort of attacks are consistently degrading the Ukrainian energy infrastructure, and that's not something you can build back quickly and easily. So this is unsustainable for the Ukrainians. They are going to have to find a way of mitigating against this. So obviously air defense, but also they need to work out some kind of energy strategy. I'm sure they are, of course they are, with regard to giving themselves consistent uh, energy so that their economy can keep functioning so that military industrial complex can keep functioning and of course so people can have energy consistently throughout the day themselves it really affects morale but it also affects ukraine's ability to um to protect itself by manufacturing its own uh, equipment and also having an economy that that pays money uh, into the coffers to uh, prosecute their defensive war so this is the energy infrastructure vulnerability is that is the single biggest i think challenge even more so than the mobilization at the moment for the ukrainians now the ukrainians hit yeysk uh air base the other day and better imagery has now come out what initially looked like burned grass on the poorer quality images actually can be confirmed as as a precision hit uh so this one's uh, a good uh, good image comparison so you have both a hangar over here or some kind of warehouse over here getting hit and damaged. Um, and then you have this one being completely obliterated. And there was talk that this is where they were storing Shahid drones. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, the Ukrainian Navy released satellite imagery confirming the destruction of the Shahid drone base in Russia's Krasnodar Krai. On the 21st of June, Joint Operations Security Service targeted the 167th Training Center in Yeysk, also eliminating instructors and cadets. Um, so that's good, good strike there from the Ukrainian point of view. And indeed, uh, here it is from the ground. And yeah, that, that warehouse is uh, a former warehouse uh, destroyed uh, by the Navy in cooperation with the Security Service of Ukraine. Ukraine. Okay, moving on to other bits and pieces. We're going to start with um, the official who gave Putin wrong intelligence on the Ukraine war resigns. Sergei Peseda has resigned as head of the Fifth Service of Russia's Federal Security Service, FSB, a Russian investigative outlet, Important Stories, reported yesterday, citing undisclosed sources. The Fifth Service provided Russian dictator Putin with information about political developments in Ukraine on the eve of the full-scale invasion, according to important stories. Based on this, Rus the, this intelligence, the Russian authorities were confident that the Russian army would not meet any serious resistance in Ukraine. Now, if you have been watching me at all over the last couple of years, I wrote an article on this at the beginning of the war, and I was just speaking to Jonathan Fink and Anna from Ukraine on Silicon Curtain about exactly this like i'm fascinated with how russia had the the wrong information how you got putin making this insanely bad decision like this is almost the most important aspect of the war is like the war the decision to invade ukraine shouldn't have taken place like putin got it completely wrong and had had he known really had he known what's happening now and where russia would be now in terms of economic sanctions uh, political pariah the complete dis destruction basically degradation of their conventional armed forces or, or the ground forces etc cetera, etc cetera. had he known all this where russia would be now he wouldn't have attacked right and it would have been insane to have attacked so he attacked thinking it would all be hunky dory and it would be a three day special military operation and they would um they would get rid of the the Zelensky government and introduce their own puppet administration. So that's not 
you know, that didn't happen. And they were met with resistance straight away from the Ukrainian army to the point where two and a half years later, they're still trying to achieve a fraction of what their initial objective or objectives were. So something went seriously wrong in the gathering of information or I've talked previously about, you know, Vranya, about this BS going up the hierarchy until someone actually believes this and then can't really verify it. Talked about how Putin doesn't use the internet, so you can't verify uh, the information that's being given to him independently. He has to go almost back to the people that's given that information to verify that information. So there's a real information ecosystem problem going on there right at the very top. But in terms of that level below, these people gathering information that then gets fed to to Putin, you know, what went wrong there? How how did these people misjudge so badly what's going on, uh, uh, what was going on, or what would happen in Ukraine? I just don't know. Anyway, one of the guys primarily responsible for delivering that information could get i don't know synthesizing that information and delivering it to putin has ended up resigning i'd say probably two years too late there but um yeah fascinating um uh, that's one of the areas uh, that you know when this war I is over and we look back historically on this conflict just what led up to it what was going on in the kremlin prior to the conflict it's going to be fascinating if we ever find that out. Right. AP Associated Press has done a big um, article as the US supplied weapons show impact inside Russia. Ukrainian soldiers hope for deeper strikes. We're going to go on to talk about that for a second. But um, there are there are lots of quotes in here, some of which we've actually looked at. Um, I don't know if the AP, because it's a press agency that ends up being and part of other articles so you quite often you see like new york times and it says you know written with the associated press or whatever so as a press agency they they're often responsible of for having you know responsible for other articles and other media sources anyway i digress point is we've seen some of these bits and pieces in other articles i think uh one is the talk about so i think it's a washington post article that talked about the uh, 20 kilometers um behind the border uh which is in this ap article here so anyway um it says the u.s expanded the scope of its policy to allow counter strikes across a wider region on friday but the biden administration has not lifted restrictions on ukraine that prohibit the use of u.s provided a tackums to strike inside russian territory according to three u.s officials familiar with the matter who spoke on condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to comment publicly the u.s began providing ukraine with long-range attackums earlier this year but with rules including that they cannot be used to strike inside russia and must be used with within sovereign territory which includes land seized by the russians that prevents attacks on air fields and military infrastructure in Russia's deep rear and underscoring a common Ukrainian complaint that Western allies, anx uh, allies anxious about potentially provoking Russia are undermining Ukraine's ability to fight effectively. Ukrainian officials are pushing US allies to be able to strike particular high-value targets inside Russia using ATACMs that can reach over 100 kilometers, 62 miles. Quote, unfortunately, we still cannot reach, for example, airfields and their aircraft. This is a problem, Yehor Cherniev, uh, Deputy Chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on National Security defense and intelligence said earlier this month quote that's why we are asking allies to lift restrictions to use long-range missiles against limited military targets in the territory of russia since late may and this is a quote from this is basically what we saw in the washington post i think since late may ukraine has been able to target russian troops and air defense systems 20 kilometers 12 miles from the border in the kharkiv region moscow opened a new front in the region made a tent ca capturing village after village in a sweeping advance that caught ukrainian troops unprepared it's the idea that that really they can still only strike 20 kilometers in the border that is not uh, good enough but any, anyway one of the other um interesting points about this article is is from the uh, next couple of paragraphs actually uh we'll go to that this one here so at the time the stakes were uh, were high as ukrainian military leaders anticipated another assault designed to divert troops from uh, other intense battlegrounds in the Donetsk region. So this is the attack into Kharkiv. First Deputy Defence Minister Ivan Havrilyuk told the Associated Press that at least 90,000 troops 
uh, Russian troops deep in Russian territory were gearing up for a new assault. So we had heard 50,000. Now we're hearing that actually 90,000 troops. Of course, they're not all going to be frontline troops. There's going to be lots of logistics and supply and all sorts going on there that will require, you know, troops. Um, but still, you know, this is a huge attack in the Kharkiv, um, into the Kharkiv Oblast that has been blunted by the Ukrainians really successfully to the point where the Russians are drawing troops supposedly from other parts of the front line in order to uh, keep plugging away in Kharkiv. Just, yeah, it was an operational disaster, I would claim. But there are other areas of the front line where the Russians are um, succeeding more. Now, Zelensky has said, so in light of what we've just heard from that AP article, Zelensky has said, we are working as hard as possible to en enable Ukraine to respond fully to terror. So, quote, Ukraine needs the necessary forces and means to neutralize the delivery systems of these bombs, including Russian combat aircraft where they exist. We must take this action, the president stated in his evening video address. And this is super important. You've got Zelensky very explicitly saying that we need to be able to hit these air bases. It's, it's really frustrating that they can't do this. Eight Atakams into uh, Belgrade to hit those air bases would be absolutely crucial for Ukrainian success. But no, they can't do it at the moment. Uh, Ukraine urgently needs military means to counter Russian bombers targeting its cities, Zelensky stated. Essential needs include advanced air systems, says Euromaidan Press, defense systems and accelerated F-16 fighter, uh, uh, F-16 fighter jet training for Ukrainian pilots. Um yeah, so this is this is what what he said. This is what we've just been talking about. The need Ukraine needs the necessary forces and means to destroy the carriers of these bombs. This has to change. Like that's the big thing that needs to change now, because otherwise you will continue to see those guided guide bombs and maybe uh, far three thousand hitting the middle of Kharkiv city. Okay, they can't slam in the S-300 missiles anymore, so they're just going to keep dropping those those guided glide bombs, indiscriminately killing civilians in the middle of Kharkiv. And, and the US and allies can do something about that, but predominantly the US here disallowing the Ukrainians from using ATACMs to strike air bases, you know, because of the these weird rules about only hitting the air aircraft when they're in the air just about a far at you or whatever like seriously you need to be taking them out when they're on the ground so that they can't take up on fire take off and fire you know it's just arbitrary rules that don't make any sense anyway the international atomic energy agency confirms the destruction of the luch substation near zaporizhia nuclear power plant substation provides electricity to parts of the city of anahada uh, such as the city's water pumping station in the industrial zone. The city partly has been without power since the 19th of June. Now, I don't know how, how, what's destroyed that substation, whether it's the Ukrainians or, or the uh, Russians, but, you know, the nuclear power station at Zaporizhia has become this almost political and military football between the two sides uh, as the Russians seek to kind of weaponize it. I don't know. It's, it's, a, real, it's a real challenge. Um, news outlets report an explosion at a thermal power plant in Kiev. I reported this yesterday, but not in the right place. Uh, so this happened, uh, I think, irrespective of uh, any uh, wave of, of missiles and drones. This was just a separate explosion and no air raid alert was declared in the capital. So it could have been uh, something going off there uh, as, a, as a result of the fragility of the power system. Well, actually similar sort of issue here in Krivi Rear. So there was a malfunction at the plant, at the uh, coke plants due to a power outage in Krivi Rear. The city was covered in smog. So today, quote, today around 5 a.m., several production facilities were suddenly disconnected from the external power grid. Employees were forced to resort to several crisis technological actions to preserve production equipment, in particular coke production equipment, and ensure the safety of employees. So that could have just been some random, like, maintenance issue there but ukraine is struggling to maintain its power uh, grid its energy infrastructure and that will have knock-on effects to everything else else that uses power and needs consistent power if you have these very important production processes that are are being um kind of degraded by having inconsistent power then you are 
it's just very it's very dangerous and it's not helping economically and uh, you can get issues like this turning up okay uh, finally this is what freedom looks like in russia uh Russia, 15-year-old child, Arseny Turbin, has been sentenced to five years and sent to Moscow size 5 prison for distributing leaflets critical of Putin in 2023. Human rights organisation Memorial Foundation classified him as the youngest political pr prisoner in Russia's modern history. A at 14, Turbin contacted the Russian Freedom Legion and made anti-Putin leaflets in June 2023. Previous month, his social media avatar was a huge letter Z. He posted photos of Prigozhin's monument and celebrated Russia Day, recently self-described nationalist and patriot. Um, so there you go. Uh, yeah, just imprisoning children um, for being critical of Putin there. Um, nice one, Russia. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Sorry, my brain isn't working very well today. Um, I do apologise. Um, have a good one and I'll speak to you soon.